So the last talk in the morning session is uh, given by um, Zen, Zen, uh, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Zen, uh, Zubet, Zubet, Zof. <laughs> I'm sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> and he's going to talk about quantum higher spin gravity. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you very much for having me here, given this opportunity to speak, and also for wonderful and really hot conference. No possible sense. And uh, so this is another higher spin talk. So I will be talking about higher spin gravity and uh, basically the story is why higher spin particles are important for successful quantization of gravity. The point that is also well illustrated by string theory, but we have sort of simplified models of this uh, thing uh, that are uh, fixed by it seem to be completely different uh, uh, reasons, but still not unrelated uh, to string. So, and the main message is, is that uh, so even though higher spin gravity is this hypothetical series with graviton and massless higher spin fields have been studied for many years, but until recently there hasn't been a single example worked out like in detail, like action quantization, you can prove things and so on, even, even though we saw some progress towards this I mean, earlier today in Antal's talk. And the, another story is that there are many, many no-go theorems in flat space uh, that against uh, higher spins and uh, recently it was shown that many of them extend to ADS and ADS-CFT where it's tempting to interpret the same results as a kind of superposition of yes, go, and no, go. I will explain what I mean by that, but one, one basic conclusion is there, there is not much difference between flat and ADS as far as higher spin uh, fields are concerned. And uh, uh, so our result is that we managed to construct an example of uh, higher spin uh, gravity quantize it, and I will discuss how it complies with all these no-go theorems. Uh, I forgot to say that this is done uh, in uh, in a bunch of papers with friends, uh, Mitya Panamarev, who gave a uh, talk earlier this week on a uh, closely related thing, uh, PhD student Tank Tran and Miriam Tsulaya. So uh, another thing is that uh, the theory that we constructed, if you if you take it in ADS, then we can ask what it is dual to, and it's dual to certain limit of Chern-Simons meta theories that we all discussed uh, yesterday. And as such, it provides a I mean, rather simple and complete model of gauge gravity duality in the sense that both sides are I mean, easy to write down and do computations. Okay, so these are the main messages. And in my talk, I will be jumping between flat space, ADS, and also ADS CFT, depending on which point I'm going to illustrate. So let me start with uh, flat space. And uh, it has been long known that massless particles uh, with spin greater than two are special, they don't want to exist. And there are many no-go th theorems that maybe rightfully prevented many people from working on this topic at least uh, uh, decades ago. And one of the most powerful results is the Weinberg Law Energy Theorem. So imagine you have a theory with a bunch of particles and you're interested in S metrics and uh, there is at least one massless particle. So the requirement for S-matrix to be Lorentz invariant, which is basically gauge invariant, uh, imposes some constraints that you can easily read off in the low energy limit. And if a massless particle has spin one, what you find is just sum of all charges should be zero. So the total charge must be conserved, and we are, of course, totally happy with this. Uh, if massless particle has spin two, then you have the same sum, but now it's weighted by power of momentum. And of course, on top of that, you always have total momentum conservation. And uh, like the only way to, to have non-trivial scattering seems to be that all these uh, coupling constants should be equal to each other. So it factors out, and then everything works. And in this way, you can discover the equivalence principle, some form of equivalence principle, as Weinberg pointed out. Namely, all particles should couple universally to gravity. Unfortunately, if spin is greater than two, so you have more powers of momenta, and you have tensorial conservation law that prevents S matrix, uh, I mean, from like prevents this particle from having any non-trivial scattering. So this is one argument against. Another argument in the same spirit, also constraining S matrix, is coleman mandula theorem. So uh, it constrains possible symmetries of S matrix by saying, for example, that it's impossible to have higher spin charges. The argument is, is very similar to Weinberg, because if you, if you had a higher spin charge, so it would carry some indices transforming non trivially under the Lorentz group, and in practice, uh, these indices would be carried by momenta. So again, you have to have um, tensorial conservation law constraining your dynamics too much as to have non-trivial scattering. But of course, there are exceptions, well-known supersymmetry and two dimensions. There is another result that is not about this matrix, but it's also very easy to describe. Uh, so usually people 
describe higher spin particles by mm, uh, filled with S indices and uh, gauge symmetry that generalizes naturally that of uh, Maxwell and linearized diffeomorphisms. And there is a decent uh, two derivative action that is invariant under such symmetries. However, if you use the, if you use the standard spell to covariantize derivative as to couple your theory to, to gravity, at least background gravity, then in checking gauge invariance, which is of course necessary thing to have a consistent theory, you have to commute derivative and unfortunately, uh, for, uh, you will find the full four index Riemann tensor as an abstraction. And again, for lower spin particles, for one reason or another, this doesn't happen. So the problem starts with uh, spin five half or three. Okay, uh, so I think everything can be then nicely illustrated by this quote from uh, Matthew Schwartz's textbook that an interesting and profound result is that it's impossible to have interacting theory of massless particles with spin greater than two. The required gauge invariance would be so restrictive that nothing could satisfy it. So my talk is uh, how more we can maybe avoid this or uh, uh, at least not to be immediately inconsistent with all these general theorems. Uh, yeah, because all these no-go theorems, they constrain S matrix, which means some observables at infinity and they have little to say about local things. And uh, an interesting result obtained many years ago by Brink, Bankston Squared, and Linden using light cone approach, as it usually happens, first results are obtained within light cone approach. So they found some consistent cubic interactions. And this seemed to be in some tension with this no go, because why nature would give you opportunity to, co uh, to couple particles, at least in the first approximation, while, while saying at the same time that S matrix must be trivial. So I will explain how it can be consistent. Now, okay, that's the end of flat space for now. So let's jump to ADS and see what are the difference. The bold statement that there is not much difference, but just interpretation. Uh, so the most basic higher spin ADS safety duality conjectures were put forward by Klebanov, Polikov, Sesginson, Bell, and Lee and Petko. Uh, some of them are not in the audience, but yeah. Uh, and uh, the simplest one is that free vector model, which is a fancy name for uh, free scalars, uh, should be due to a higher spin theory whose spectrum contains totally symmetric fields. So it's very easy to explain because if you have a free scalar field, uh, so you can sandwich derivatives in between the uh, th these two fields in such a way as to construct conserved current called higher spin current. And of course, stress tensor is just a particular member of this infinite family, so you have infinitely many currents and uh, rank S operator uh, tensor field uh, should be dual to spin S field in the bulk and because current is conserved, uh, the, the dual field should be gauge field, massless field. Uh, so, of course, correlation functions in such theory are just given by free weak contractions that uh, a child can do, but nevertheless, they are not zero. And because they are not zero, the dual theory should be interacting as to properly account for all these non-zero correlation functions. So, there is another duality that is more interesting. Uh, so, critical ve vector model or Wilson-Fisher CFT that uh, is, I mean, is a very physical model because it describes many of the second-order phase transitions in three dimensions, in particular Isenck model. So the statement is that the conjecture is that critical vector model should be dual to the same theory, but with a different choice of boundary conditions. So in CFT you can play with boundary conditions. But also there is a quite general result, not related to higher spins at all, that uh, connects uh, two dualities. If you have two CFTs and they're dual to the same theory, just for different choice of boundary condition, then they're not totally unrelated. And you can prove quite generally that, uh, say, the second duality follows from the first one. So if you happen to prove the first one, then the second one follows immediately. Uh, okay, so we can maybe forget for a moment about this one and discuss this case. So another quite general result is that if you uh, have conformal field theory in dimension greater than two, and on top of stress tensor, you happen to have at least one higher spin current, then you can prove, as was first done by Moldasen and Zhibuyedov in three dimensions, that, uh, that in fact you have to have infinitely many of such higher spin currents, and your CFT is a free CFT maybe in disguise, in the sense that all correlation functions are given by free weak contractions. And as, as these authors pointed out, this essentially proves the duality no matter how bulk theory is realized. Uh, because uh, you can, you can uh, think of this result as uh, 
on-shell analysis of higher spin gravity, namely you can strain in holographic S matrix just by studying symmetries like uh, Weinberg or Coleman Mandula result do. And uh, again, another interpretation would be that this is generalization of Con Coleman Mandula theorem to Eddie's CFT in the sense that higher spin symmetries imply that your dual CFT is a free one. Uh, which may be appropriate generalization of what S equal one means in uh, ADS CFT setup. So basically with uh, 50 years delay, we see that asymptotic higher spin symmetries, just linearized uh, gauge symmetries, always completely fix uh, S matrix or holographic S matrix. And then if your space is flat, it's one. If it's asymptotic ADS, then you have free CFT and would be interesting uh, to study maybe some other examples where higher spin can propagate, uh, but uh, so. But uh, I mean, this bunch of results, uh, as I said, you can interpret as a superposition of yes go and no go because nothing prevents these theories from existing in principle. And uh, ingenious idea is to read this uh, formula from, from uh, right to left, and that. Uh, if you know your CFT, you know all correlation functions, you can try to just manufacture interactions in the bulk as to reproduce exactly these correlation functions. And what, uh, this was successfully done, at least to the quartic order, in a number of papers by Becker and Menger, Ponomer of Slight, and then there were some la uh, papers later. Uh, so in this sense, you, you can construct uh, higher spin series. Clearly, you can do this to all orders. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, the, the, the S matrix you already know in this sense. Okay, so maybe let's move back to flat space because EDS complicates things, of, of course, but as far as problem of high spin interaction is concerned, there is maybe not much difference, but of course, uh, flat space is easier to deal with. And uh, so we would like to reconsider the problem of high spin interactions, and for this we need some rather fundamental approach as to take into account all the possible subtleties. Uh, and uh, so we can do just uh, what doctor ordered in the sense that uh, constructing field theory or quantum field theory is about uh, writing down expressions for Poincaré algebra charges in terms of your fields. For example, Hamiltonian would look like that. And of course, we are interested in possible uh, nonlinear cor corrections to the generators. And this is exactly what light approach does. Uh, so most of the generators, they stay as in free theory, they are quadratic, so you, you should take care of only of two generators, Hamiltonian and uh, boost generators. And the only equation to be solved is that they should commute. And so if you write this equation perturbatively, then it looks like it's uh, it is, uh, one equation for two functions. Moreover, uh, you can easily solve it because quadratic Hamiltonian just computes uh, the total energy, so you can immediately, immediately solve it for whatever Hamiltonian you have here. And uh, the way it works and the way you can bootstrap all theories uh, like gravity, young Mills, and also higher spins, as I will show you, is that, uh, of course, this moment in denominator, this is the worst non-locality you can have. And the way it works is that you, carefully, you should carefully adjust this interacting Hamiltonian in such a way that this thing cancels. And this is what makes uh, one equation for two functions non-trivial to solve. Oops. Yeah, okay. So, uh, no, no, that was slight. And uh, so if we, if we stay in four dimensions, then we have additional advantage because in four dimensions, massless fields have two propagating degrees of freedom. So spin S field equals two scalars, which you can label by helicity. And as Breen and collaborators and later Mitsai have shown, there are consistent at least cubic deformations uh, uh, of Hamiltonian, and they look like that. So, of course, it's trilinear in the field. And then uh, there are some features of light cone approach that might be unpleasant to look at. But as people noticed long ago, there is close relation between light cone approach and spinner helicity. So there is kinematical factor here that has a clear interpretation in terms of spinner helicity formalism. <laughs> and uh, then the most important thing to take take care of are these numbers. These are coupling constants. So for example, if you trying to bootstrap Young-Mills theories in this way, this would be a structure constant of some Lie algebra. So, but uh, we will be interested in having these numbers uh, non-zero for higher spin fields as well. OK, so uh, then you can easily see that you can avoid aragon bezer argument, uh, this currentization of derivative problem, because in the light cone approach, there is a 
nice two derivative interaction, uh, interaction vertex between uh, graviton and massless spin S field. But of course, uh, this uh, cubic study is not the end of the story. But you have to make sure that Poincare algebra closes at all orders. And for example, if you uh, bootstrap, try to bootstrap something like Young Mills theory, then at the quartic order you will find Jacobi identity for your structure constants. So this is not the end of the story. And, uh, but still, something can be learned uh, quite easily. For example, if you take Einstein-Hilbert vertex, this is how it looks in the light cone approach, and add scalar field, the usual two derivative coupling, uh, and uh, put it into the Poincaré algebra uh, relations, then what, what, what you learn is that these coupling constants must be equal. So you recover the equivalence principle just by studying Poincaré algebra closure at the quartic level. The same is true for higher spins. And remarkable result that was obtained by Mitsayev more than what a century ago is that the necessary, but not yet sufficient, condition for uh, higher spin theory to exist is that uh, this coupling constant have particular dependence on, on, on spin, on helicity. This one over gamma sum of, sum of the helicities. So this is a very important thing uh, for my, my whole story. Uh, and uh, what we noticed a few years ago is that if you simply drop uh, the complex conjugate part with other brackets, so then uh, uh, Poincaré algebra closes at the quartic order and in, at all orders. So then uh, you can write down the, the, one, the main result, uh, this one line action for higher spin gravity that contains uh, the usual gravity, spin two field, scalars and all higher spin fields, and they interact in some way. And uh, uh, part of this action are the usual vertices we are used to, like Young-Mills vertex or uh, Einstein-Hilbert vertex. Uh, so be because you can also add color into this theory, you can turn on Young-Mills gauges, and surprisingly, this comes in the, in the Chen pattern way, so, uh, uh, which is kind of stringy feature of uh, this theory. And once we have a complete classical theory, it would be interesting to quantize it and see what can go wrong or why the presence of higher spin fields is important for quantization of gravity. So let's try to do that. And uh, so if you just compute four point amplitude with say keeping one leg of shell just for fun, but it will be important later, then you'll see that it's proportional up to all these ugly light cone features, it's proportional to uh, square of the momentum. So if momentum goes on shell and you consider in uh, physical amplitude, then it vanishes. So there is some conspiracy between couplings, even though this theory is not a free one, and you do have the, even the usual interactions like uh, from Einstein-Hilbert action, uh, there is some conspiracy, and if you sum up diagrams, uh, they seem to give you vanishing result. And then you can uh, compute higher order amplitudes by using the general variance gill identity that you can glue lower, uh, lower order amplitudes with uh, some legs being off shell as to produce higher point amplitudes. So to this off shell momentum squared, so the physical amplitude vanishes. So far we are not, we are not inconsistent uh, with no goal results. And so let's try then uh, uh, quantize it further. So let's compute loops. And the first loop to compute is just a one loop determinant. So here, if you go back a bit to covariant description, I started with uh, then this one loop partition function that has very nice form. So the, the denominator is just kinetic term of higher spin field, and numerator comes from Gauss, this remnant of gauge symmetry. And now you see that Gauss of the next field would like to cancel the determinant of the previous field. So it's tempting to interpret this uh, whole partition function as one. Of course, it's, a, it's infinite product, so you have to um, regularize it, but it, it's tempting to adopt such a regu regularization that uh, they all cancel each other. And it was also noted by Tetlin Vicaria recently that I mean, you, you, you can interpret this result that this equals one or wants to be equal to one as uh, the fact that the total number of uh, uh, effective degrees of freedom vanishes in the following way. You have one uh, degree of freedom for scalar field and then each massless field contributes two. And of course, one plus one plus one is minus one half, so it's zero. Uh, this looks like an ad hoc assumption, but there are many, many more non-trivial examples <coughs> Uh, of one loop determinants in entity sitter that convinced us that zeta function is the way to go with uh, higher spins. Because uh, if you do the same computation in the entity sitter space, then even massless fields have certain mass-like terms. 
and this mass uh, term that is proportional to cosmological constant depends on spin in such a way that now there is no obvious cancellation between numerator and denominator, so you have to regularize this infinite sum of product and see what happens. And if you adopt zeta function regularization, then as many people showed, uh, sometimes you are not getting zero, but, uh, so sometimes you do get zero, but depending on the spectra and what, you, what you're computing, sometimes you're not getting zero, but you're getting quite non-trivial numbers like this log two zeta three, and this number is exactly the sphere of uh, free energy of free scalar field that this theory is supposed to be dual to, and so on. So these numbers are, of course, very hard to fake, but uh, using zeta function regularization, uh, you can reproduce them, and this, this is what convinced us that zeta function uh, works nicely in the higher spin case. So then I will be using this again and again. Okay, uh, so uh, how much time, by the way, you have? Just a, is a matter of things. Hmm? Okay, good. So I'll, I'll skip some of the details, but you can lo look at the higher loop diagrams. They cancel for different reasons. Uh, then you can start computing loops with the legs. And now you see something interesting because uh, we already showed that at three level amplitude vanish, physical amplitude vanish, so you don't expect this uh, integrals to have any cuts. And indeed, all these integrals are some nice rational functions. But what's more important is that uh, on top of integrating over momenta, you have to sum over spins because the, there are many, many in, uh, vertices here, so sum over spins is implicit. And if you do that, then uh, this total number of degrees of freedom factors out. I mean, of course, it's infinite sum, but uh, we already agreed uh, to consider it be equal to zero because of this zeta function regularization argument. So, and this happens for all loops. So then you see that uh, there are some nice rational remnants that would be nice to give interpretation, and perhaps they are related to self-dual young Mills, as uh, I think so Mita tried to argue earlier this week in his talk. And, uh, but what's important right now is just these thin factors out, which makes all loop vanish. So uh, eventually you see that because of all these coupling conspiracy reasons, the multitude of interactions that you can in principle have, so that you have to sum over, uh, they all cancel eventually. So the DS matrix is one. And then of course, uh, maybe the natural question would be if S matrix is one, whether you should consider this theory to be free or interacting, but maybe one answer is that uh, there are many other questions that are not related to S matrix. And also an another argument would be that uh, the, the, the action, this cubic action that we have, it contains the usual interactions, which are like parts of uh, einstein hilbert action, and there is no redefinition that maps it to free, I mean, in, in the usual sense. So it's not just redefinition from a bunch of uh, free scalars. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, it's, uh, for us, it's just a uh, simplified model of uh, EDS story, because uh, as I try to argue, this uh, result that S matrix has to be one in flat space is analogous to S equal free CFT in anti de Sitter setup. So the summary for the flat space is that there are indeed many no-go theorems, but light cone allows you to avoid all of them, at least formally, in four dimensions, and one can construct the theory and quantize it, and you see uh, the importance of uh, higher spin fields, and namely uh, of the fact that uh, there are infinitely many of fields in your theory. This is what makes it work, as well as some particular structure of uh, couplings that is secretly imposed by higher spin symmetry. Uh, so this uh, theory displays some stringy features that I didn't have time to discuss, for example, chain pattern factors that you can add. Uh, and also, one can show that uh, this uh, like more standard higher spin gravities, which are non-chiral, as the theory we have, they are unlikely to exist in the usual sense, because if you go to the quartic order, you find some problem with the locality, so your interactions become uh, non-local, but uh, the same result was shown to be true in, in ADS. So again, and it was discussed by Antal earlier today, that starting from the quartic order, uh, your vertices don't look like uh, 
the usual vertices in the field theory, but so maybe we should just reconsider what's local, what's non-local, and in this sense, I don't see big difference between flat space and eddies. But uh, okay, let, let's jump quickly to eddies and see what happens there, because the natural question would be if, you, if, if, if this theory, chiral higher spin gravity, can be uplifted to eddies, because then we can discuss also eddies safety duality. And it seems it can, because uh, some of the couplings uh, are known in anti-de-sitter space, and they have the same dependence on spin. So it seems that there is no problem. You just write down the same action, but, but of course, a light cone approach in uh, anti-de-sitter uh, space is, a, is even more uh, ugly than, uh, than in flat space, but there is no conceptual problem. And then, OK, so what then uh, the, the, the duels of such guys? So recently, <coughs> A lot of attention was devoted to so-called Chern-Simons meta theories. In particular, it was discussed in the talk yesterday. So these are theories which contain scalars and fermions that are coupled to Chern-Simons. Not only these are nice uh, conformal field theories interacting non-trivial in three dimensions, but they also exhibit this uh, three-dimensional bosonization duality and many others. Uh, and uh, uh, then you can ask if they have gravitational dual, and just by looking at the spectrum, you can easily see that they should have uh, gravitational dual, which is a higher spin theory. So the theory of the same type, you have maybe every spin in one copy and they should interact in some non-trivial way. Okay, so then uh, what this chiral higher spin gravity should correspond to is certain limit of uh, Chern-Simons meta theories where you take this effective hooked coupling to plus minus uh, imaginary infinity, so it's uh, it's not unitary limit, but if you compute observables, so they depend nicely on this toothed coupling, and there is no problem to take this limit. In particular, Moldasen and Zhibayedov uh, proved that three-point functions in all such theories have very peculiar form, so you have three structures here coming from boson, fermion, and there is a structure that is called order. It doesn't show up in free theories, and there is particular dependence on effective uh, number of degrees of freedom and hooked coupling. So if you take this limit here, I mean, the structure greatly simplifies and you have some particular combination of uh, uh, these three structures. Yeah, so th that's a conjecture. And uh, so then, uh, so what's nice about this uh, is that this gives you a complete uh, gauge gravity duality model in the sense that you have a, a rather simple CFT. Uh, and I think it would be nice to study this limit more on CFT side because it seems that uh, there should be lots of simplification as compared to the usual case, the generic case where you have this hoofed coupling. Uh, and uh, the, the dual theory is uh, this chiral higher spin gravity that has this one line action and stops at the a cubic order. And so this can be also uh, interpret it as a self-dual, because as Mita showed in his work, there is some relation between this higher spin, chiral higher spin gravity and self-dual Young Mills. So I mean, I, I'm not sure whether this name chiral is appropriate, maybe you should call it self-dual. But what's interesting is that you have two rather simple descriptions of gauge gravity duality on both sides. And uh, this is a complete story, because there should not be at least uh, uh, I mean, the, the problem would be, uh, I mean, as, as usual, that on, on gravitational side you have to, uh, to add maybe the full string uh, theory and so on, but in this case it seems that this is a complete description of duality. So let me conclude by saying that uh, I think I, I, so I try to convince you that there is not much difference between flat space and eddies as far as interactions of higher spins are concerned. And at least some of higher spin gravities seem to exist. So we, we consider the chiral case, but there is also conformal higher spin gravity studied by these people. Some of them are in, in the audience. And as we learned from uh, Alessandro talk uh, a couple of days ago in three dimensions, so there is a lot of things that you can extract from Chern Simon's uh, description of higher spin gravities. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, and the last point is that this chiral higher spin gravity in ADS seems to be a complete toy model that displays uh, some stringy features and uh, also interesting duality to this Chern Simons meta series. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, any questions, comments?
Maybe if you can comment on this comment that you have on tri trivial S matrix in flat but non trivial in ADS, which is your last comment over there. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have S equal one in flat space, yes. but in ADS you say it's not so. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not so, mm -hmm. but uh, these two statements are consequence of one and the same formula. So you just impose highest symmetry on whatever is matrix in flat space or ADS, and uh, the important result you get is that it's completely fixed. But it's completely fixed to be one in flat, while in, in ADS we have a more interesting uh, story, but still it's completely fixed by highest symmetry. Okay, okay. Any further comments or questions? So in the, in the case where the S matrix was one, in the example you explained, mm -hmm. how do you know there is no filler definition that makes the action quadratic? Uh, uh, yeah, but, because, because when you construct theory, in particular in the light cone approach, of course you have to mod out by the definitions and so on. So these are not uh, just expressions that uh, are consistent with concur algebra, you have to find non-trivial definitions. And this problem was, of course, analyzed, and what we are using are interaction vertices that can't be redefined to free. In particular, say, the usual Einstein Hilbert uh, vertex is there, and we know that you can't map it to free theory. So, but uh, I think there are like, other examples. Maybe South Boolean Mills is very close in the sense that it also has, uh, say, three level S matrix vanishes, and then there are some rational things uh, at, at, at the loop level, which actually also present. In, Subsector of Yamus. So, in a the sense, there is no like, immediate inconsistency between these two facts. Yes, uh, the S matrix observable is kind of trivial, but maybe there are other interesting questions that we can ask about such theories. And also, I don't think there is any meaningful redefinition that maps it to, to free one at just at the level of the action. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Do you have any announcement?